Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Dark Talks. Uh, I'm Dr. Manji George, the scientific director at Paltown, the nonprofit that supports Colentown. Today, we have a, an esteemed panel with us, and uh, they're going to tell us about um, what they found interesting at ASCO GI. Um, so how, the, how this will be organized is that um, each um, panelist will go and speak about um, what they found interesting, and then um, we will have the other panelists comment and then there'll be a small period of time where people can ask questions. So please um, type your questions in chat. Um, so we will first start with uh, Dr. Eng. My name is Dr. Kathy Eng from Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. I'm here in Nashville, Tennessee. I am the David H. Johnson Endowed Chair in Surgical Medical Oncology, and I'm the co-chair and co-director of the GI Research Program here at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center, as well as the director of the Young Adult Cancers Program. My true passion is clinical research, and my focus primarily is colorectal carcinoma patients, but also specifically in our young adult patient population. I'm extremely passionate about trying to find the reason and appropriate treatment for our patients and how we can sort, support them in the best uh, manner possible. A uh, little trinket of, uh, about me, um, I am uh, normally a half marathon runner, although I did not run uh, the Houston race this year as I normally do, um, due to co other commitments, um, and I run over 30 races, and I truthfully enjoy being outdoors on a long distance run. So thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this um, presentation, and I'm always delighted to educate others about new developments in colorectal cancer. So thank you, um, uh, Manju and all of Pal Paltown for inviting me. And uh, it's it's a joy to speak with my other colleagues. So Manju, in full uh, disclosure, gave me a wish list of all the things she wanted me to talk about. So I'm going to try my best. And um, there's my contact information if I am not successful by the time allotted. So these are some of the uh, discussion points we'll be talking about. A practical uh, point that she wanted me to discuss is an omission of the 5-FU bolus. Um, this was a uh, poster from the NYU group, including Jordan Berlin from my institution. Um, and just once again, many of us don't include the 5-FU bolus in our um, chemotherapy regimen. And here, this is a retrospective analysis of looking over 26,000 patients with a total of about 10,000 total. But as you can see here, there's really no difference in regards to overall survival. So you should feel comfortable with the omission of your 5-FU bolus. What about the role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Thought-provoking, uh, Foxtrot recently just got published, um, and this is looking at the role of neoadjuvant oxaliplatin-based therapy. Um, once again, I'm just going to show you just this slide because it's still very um, controversial. Um, keep in mind, it is difficult to image patients well for colon carcinoma, unlike rectal cancer. This is over 1,000 patients, but they did know, notice an improvement um, and a re uh, relapse-free survival recurrence-free survival, sorry, with the use of uh, neoadjuvant therapy in, um, in that setting. Uh, once again, interesting, um, but is it the standard of care at this point? I would say no. Okay, let's focus on colorectal cancer. So the SUNSHINE trial was a phase three trial that was presented at ASCO GI, and it was based upon this phase two study that was presented by the Dutch group, noting an improvement in uh, TAS-102, or lawn surf, as you may know it, with the addition of bevacizumab in stage four colorectal cancer. This trial was then completed specifically in the third line setting for the majority of patients largely conducted overseas because, as you know here, many of our patients um, would already be receiving Lonserf plus bevacizumab um, in the third or fourth line setting. This is a one-to-one -one randomization with the overall survival being the primary endpoint. And what they noted, um, sorry, the demographics are very comparable between uh, the groups largely conducted in Europe, once again, about um, of the patients that were treated, 24% had never received prior bevacizumab, which is unlike what we would see here in the United States, where the majority of patients would have received bevacizumab from the first or second line therapy setting, unless, of course, there's a contraindication due to a recent cardiac event or recent stroke. So the primary endpoint was overall survival, and the investigators were able to demonstrate that as noted here, with an improvement in overall survival versus lawn surf alone. Once again, third line setting. Uh, Progression-free survival was also improved in this setting. Once again, um, third line setting for stage four patients. 
And there was a slight response rate. We do not expect a large response from the drug because Lonserp in and of itself is less than 1%, but improvement in durability of response. And as expected, very typical for this drug, it causes myelosuppression, meaning a drop in um, your white blood cell count notably. Now, I show this trial here, the Fresco study, because some of you may not have seen this. This was presented at ESMO, and in, all, in full disclosure, I'm the senior investigator with Arvind Asari. This trial was conducted in a heavily protruded patient population, not just the third-line setting. We allowed prior lawn serif, we allowed prior regorafenib, or the combination, and it was a two-to-one randomization. Primary endpoint here was also overall survival. Um, once again, uh, this was an international trial conducted not only in uh, the United States, but in Asia and in um, the EU, and the median lines of prior therapy was five. This is an oral, very selective tyrosine kinase inhibitor of VEGF receptors one, two, and three. So unlike bevacizumab, it blocks three different receptors, not just one. So it is not chemotherapy. It is specifically an oral anti-angiogenic agent. And this were, these were the results. The primary endpoint was overall survival, and there was an improvement of 2.6 months. It is currently sitting at the FDA pending review. Um, and once again, this was a heavily protruded patient population. Um, Progression-free survival was also improved. So hopefully we'll have another new option for patients. So we're, if I were to break it down, um, sunlight versus fresco. Sunlight, third line setting, 24% of patients had never received prior bevacizumab, largely conducted in the EU. Main side effect is a drop in your white blood cell count. Fresco is not a chemotherapy agent. It is similar to bevacizumab, but blocks additional receptors. It's an oral agent, no chemotherapy involved, an international trial involving Asia and Europe and EU, 96% um, of patients had received prior bevacizumab. And um, main side effect is hypertension, which is a class effect, and um, hand foot syndrome and asthenia uh, sitting at the FDA at this time for review. Oh, once again, they both, I believe, have utility. Uh, you should be aware that there's currently a pending study with Frequitinib in combination with Tizolizumab. It enrolled 40 patients in the United States. It has an expanded arm in Asia. We enrolled very quickly. The study completed enrollment three months, and hopefully we'll have res some results shortly. Levatinib, as many of you know, is still pending. This is the one phase three trial that we're still waiting for the results in combination with pembrolizumab, which is immunotherapy. This enrolled very quickly as well, um, and we are still waiting for those results. And the control arm is regorafenib and in, a typical and lawn surf as well. This is without bevacizumab because it was created before Sunshine was completed. What about BRAF mutant V600E patients? Well, we know that the doublet um, is the standard of care and the progression, I'm sorry, the overall survival is about nine months in previously treated patients. Um, we know that there's some interesting data in combination with immunotherapy from Van Morris's group out of MD Anderson Cancer Center with an improvement um, of the doublet with encarafenib, cetuximab, and nivolumab. And I want you to be aware there is an ongoing trial led by SWOG that is enrolling with the two to one randomization, allowing one to two prior lines of therapy for BRAF V600E mutated mutated tumor types, um, and please enroll to that clinical trial. Now, there is a frontline study you should be aware of. There was a run-in phase that they de demonstrated a poster on uh, looking at the doublet of encarafenib and cetuximab in the frontline setting or in combination with Folfox versus standard chemotherapy. And this is just the very early results, very small numbers, but the combination with chemotherapy seems to be very promising, and that's why I show you this data here. So please enroll to that clinical trial. What about HER2 amplified metastatic colorectal cancer? Well, this is an important study because HER2 amplification is in less than 5% of our patient population. Ticatinib is a small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor of HER2. This trial basically um, had an expanded arm in combination with trezetuzumab or Herceptin, as many of you may know it small study that expanded into a larger study. Um, these were the res results reported at last year's um, meeting um, at the GI ESMO, um, very noticeable reduction in tumor size, but more importantly, improvement in progression-free survival and significant overall survival of 24.1 months. So this has now been FDA approved. This happened while we were at GI ASCO on 119. So um, please keep that in mind for your previously treated, um, if you, previously treated patients, and please, um, you should be aware it's available to you now. 
There is an ongoing frontline trial for newly diagnosed patients that are HER2 positive, um, and this is enrolling at several sites, and this is in combination with full Fox, and this is just recently opened Mountaineer 3. What about the role of circulating tumor DNA? Well, that obviously becomes very complicated. Uh, you know, circulating free DNA is basically small DNA fragments released into circulation, and it's, it can happen with healthy uh, adults. And circulating tumor DNA, uh, once again, I don't have that much time to go over all this discussion, but it's a shorter fragment and a very short half-life. And there's two different ways to go about it, blood versus tissue. Blood is obviously more accessible and quicker, but um, tumor tissue would be ideal if possible. But please keep in mind, there's variability regarding circulating tumor DNA in regards to the size of the metastasis, the location of the metastasis, the type of histology, squamous cell carcinoma more so than adenocarcinoma uh, versus mucinous, and it has to be collected correctly. Um, so just keep in mind, this is obviously of great interest um, and is still being widely investigated. Um, there was a trial, Paradigm updated their data from their uh, frontline study, um, looking at uh, left-sided tumors, full fox with penitumumab versus full fox versus bevacizumab with bevacizumab. And in this setting, they looked at hyper-selected markers. These were the markers that they were talking about specifically. And if you looked at left-sided tumors with those hyper-selected markers, meaning they were all wild type and had no mutations in those selected markers, those patients fared best overall. No surprise there. Um, is it too, loon, too soon um, to utilize circulating tumor DNA? I would just say, once again, we know that if it is positive following surgical resection, uh, ideally after at least two weeks following surgical resection, that is concerning, but you do have this opportunity by receiving additional adjuvant chemotherapy or um, systemic chemotherapy in general to clear or change your circulating tumor DNA and that impacts your recurrence. There are ongoing trials right now in the phase, I'm sorry, the stage two and stage three setting. And I think that's very important um, to enroll to these trials in the United States. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this. This was Stacey Cohen's study. It was very complicated, but really looking at the timing, and she worked um, on this with the Natera group, and the timing basically demonstrates that you can check circulating tumor DNA with some fairly good confidence following about two weeks of treatment. In all honesty, I wait till about four weeks of treatment. Um, I think that's most appropriate, and there is data um, from a white paper from Arvind Dasari um, that we published as well, um, specifically with those guidelines. And the NCIGI task force is very interested in um, uh, standardizing this for all upcoming clinical trials. So just a reminder for our young patients, don't forget there are young adult cancer patient uh, programs all across the country. And I am only one minute over time, Manju, you owe me. And um, please keep in mind, um, March is colorectal cancer screening month, and, um, and for so many of our young patients, we, we have to educate our primary care providers um, and our um, uh, pediatricians about the symptoms and signs of early onset colorectal cancer. And I can't believe I just did all that and only one minute over. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Kathy. That was great. So um, the panelists, um, what comments do you have? <clears throat> so I think it was a super presentation by <laughs> the greatest Kathy Ng. So uh, she covered uh, pretty much all the things that highlights from the colorectal cancer and TIS for most of them. Um, I think I would comment on the, you know, the both the long serve BEV uh, study in the third line. I totally agree with with Kathy that you know we've been doing this even before before seeing the results of the long serve BEV trial. And but one of the nuances of the study is you know being done outside the most of the population or outside the U.S. A portion of the patients that don't receive BEV or they're BEV naive. And so uh, there's that question, could, could the amplification of the results are you know, related to the BEV naive population? Um, but, and, and then the other question is, is it replacing you know, um, standard of care? Do we have head-to-head -head data with regorafenib? Would regorafenib perform lower? You know, we're waiting on those uh, VEGF-TKI trials. And then the Frisco study, of course, you know, showed uh, improvement and uh, later line settings, which, uh, you know, position that drug to move earlier. And, and there, as Kathy highlighted, there's an ongoing study testing that drug, hopefully with IO as well, to in, in earlier line settings. And so we're looking forward to that. Okay. Okay, great. Um, uh, Dr. Yang, I had this question. So there, I just saw today that they they had the results of solstice, where they tested Cape Bev in the same um, population. I was kind of wondering, how does all of those compare? Cape Bev, Lonserve Bev, uh, frequentinib? 
Um, can you comment on that? You know, Kate Bev is what we often consider. I mean, I think they can all chime in. Often considers a standard of care in our maintenance setting. Um, I think lawn surf, um, you know, theoretically is supposed to be a, a more novel. Uh, more interesting agent because it's supposed to prevent further breakdown of the, the product. Um, and it's taken years of development in all honesty, because I remember when they were developing it when I was a fellow. Um, but no, I, I think what's more important is we have to think about the patient, right? Lawn surf does has drawbacks in regards to myelosuppression and you have to make sure you have a compliant patient. It has a very odd schedule of um, basically five days on uh, and then Monday through Friday is the way I give it. Um, and, and sometimes you have patients that are not good about following the directions per se, and you end up with significant neutropenia, which could be problematic, especially with COVID and everything else right now. So, so um, my preference would still probably be Lonserve plus Bevacizumab um, in that setting if you're considering lines of therapy. Um, and I see somebody's putting a question, is Leucovorin always recommended with 5-FU? The answer would be no. If you don't give the bolus, I don't give Leucovorin. Um, uh, Anyways, um, sorry, uh, Manju, did I answer your question? Yes, I think so. And then um, any other comments about the sections that um, Dr. Eng presented? I would, I would agree with her about Foxtrot. I don't think we're ready to consider that, it, you know, to replace standard of care. I think surgical resection is still standard of care. I think we'd need to um, digest that a little bit more. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit difficult to use that one study to um, just replace standard of care. and across the across the world based on the on those those data. Okay. Yeah, um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy for surgeons is very challenging because we don't have great imaging. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. basically what you're saying is that because we will be imaging we'll be imaging to determine stage we may be over treating patients is that your concern? Well, if you had a uh, you know a stage 2 patient that has a resectable colon cancer, those patients are curable with surgery and you know while chemotherapy can be effective, it may be over treatment for somebody who has a resectable, you know, stage two or even a stage three colon cancer that could be resected and may not require adjuvant therapy. Um, and I could let, you know, Dr. Ng could uh, fill in the blanks there for patients who undergo resection and then don't need adjuvant therapy and could avoid some of that um, more morbidity of some of the, the adjuvant therapy that comes, comes with, uh, with chemotherapy. Okay. Okay. So for maybe a very specific group like three C or something, maybe um, neoadjuvant approaches may be better. Is that I, what you? I saying? think that in a highly select population, maybe it makes sense. You know, or if you have a big bulky sigmoid tumor or one that straddles the, you know, the, um, you know, the peritoneal reflection, maybe that makes more sense. But in you know a standard, um, you know, stage two or stage three colon cancer, I think it's a bit more debatable. Okay. And the primary endpoint of the study was two-year residual or recurrent disease. Right. Um, so I think, you know, whether or not that, how that correlates with DFS and OS was not shown in the study. 